how about just a, 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 just another big welcome uh, to Box West Welcome for Phil Collins. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm, a, I'm an office building developer in Dallas, and uh, I'm from the Midwest. I moved to Dallas in, uh, in the early 80s, actually, and I just love Texas. I'm a big fan of Houston. And, um, you know, when the Toolbox guys, I'm a supporter of Toolbox, and we were in a Bible study, and a lot of guys know my story, and they said, Collie, you'd be a good one to go talk to Toolbox. And I said, you sure? And he, they said, yeah, well, we think this will, it'd be good. But I want you to know, I'm going to tell you my life, my journey, and I've been one that, I'm a real slow learner. I uh, put myself through a lot of things that... Uh, I would hope no one else in this room has to go through to kind of wake up. But, um, and I want you to know before I start, I admire people that have their, their lives together, that find the Lord early and just live a solid life and are great parents and great role models. I'm going to tell you a little bit different story, uh, my story about how I, I, I kind of went through my life. And... Um, but I, I think we all ended up in the same place, so I just want to kind of talk to you about it. I, I, uh, I grew up in a Catholic family. I, had, I loved my dad. I looked up to him big time. Parents, really good family. I had older brother, two sisters. I was a Catholic by religion. When I would go to church, my church was a time commitment, not a relationship. So I would sit in church and think about what I was going to do when I got out. There was no, any, no other commitment to God in church other than being there. Um, I got married very young. I got married at 18. I got my girlfriend pregnant when I was 18, got married at college break. Uh, I've got four kids. Uh, I've got a son, 50, a daughter, Kelly, that's 45, and I've got twins, Hunter and Kaylee, that are, are um, 19. Um, I worked my way through college. I was always driven. I always knew I wanted to get in the real estate business. But so early on, get, get my, my girlfriend pregnant, go back to, to college. Work, I worked three jobs. I sold vacuum cleaners, tended bar, and was a maintenance man at a hotel. Um, alcohol kind of became an issue in my life after college. I graduated from college. No alcohol, no nothing. It was just work get my degree, get out. Wasn't a great student, but got the degree. Um, went back, um, got in the real estate business with my family, realized that the market there was too small. I was in a town of 8,000 people, so deal sizes weren't big enough, so I was always looking for a, a, a bigger market that I could go play in, so I started doing some business in Chicago. Came to Dallas on a vacation, fell in love with Dallas, went home, told my dad, Dad, I'm leaving. I'm going to go try Texas. And my dad said, you know, Bill, I don't want you to go, but you need to go because you can always come back. And I came to Dallas, didn't know anybody, and um, <clears throat> just kind of went through a, 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 a series of trying. I sold homes for a home builder. But my alcohol consumption, as I started getting back into business, really started ramping up. I tried to get a job uh, in the commercial side of the business and nobody would hire me because I didn't really know the city. So I was foolish enough to just start my own business. And um, I got up to where I was drinking. My life really was becoming totally unmanageable. I was drinking probably a, a quart of scotch a day. And one of the things I didn't understand about Texas was in Illinois, you could, the bars didn't close at two, you could drink till four. So one of the things I thought was good for me when I was in Dallas is they'd make me go home at two. So I thought I was being more prudent. <laughs> but um, after, I mean, when you drink a lot, you hang out with people that drink a lot so that you can validate it and it becomes normal. And when you're around everybody else that's abusing alcohol, you don't realize that, that it's not normal. It becomes normal. And um, I started drinking in the morning. So I would wake up in the morning, 
And before I'd brush my teeth, I'd grab the glass off the nightstand or wherever I left it, put some ice in it, and keep going. And you can talk yourself into a lot of things, but you know that drinking in the morning isn't, isn't good. And so I was at a point to where I knew I needed to make a change, but I didn't really know how to do it. And um, when, when I started uh, drinking in the morning, I just kind of decided I had to. I kind of went on this journey of trying to figure out what I should do. I went to see a counselor, and uh, he said, you know, you've, you've got a drinking problem. I said, well, thank you. I think I know that. But so I, I spent the weekend drinking. I went on a, a bender. And then I woke up on Monday morning, and I opened the Yellow Pages. And I found an AA meeting, and I went to AA. And it took me about 30, 60, 90 days. I, 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 I quit drinking for 30. And then I decided I could drink again. And I tested drinking. And I realized quickly I couldn't. So I went back to AA, and I got sober. I got sober on uh, September 22, 1985. So I've been, I've been free of alcohol and drugs since September 22, 1985. And thank you. And, and what sobriety gave me was self-respect. And what they teach you in AA is, if you drink a lot, you have messes everywhere. You lie, you're, you're dishonest, you owe people money, you, you're not truthful. And so I had all these messes. And one of the best things that AA did for me is it helped me get my self-respect back because I remember in the depths of my drinking, if anybody would respect me or believe me or believe anything I was saying, it would be a big day. I remember my dad looking at me in a bar one time. <clears throat> it, was a, it was St. Patrick's Day. That was always a big day for me. And um, I was smoked. And I remember I could just see in his face the, the, the disappointment. And it just haunted me. And so what AA does is it, it helps you go through and make amends to people. So if I've offended you, and I offended a lot of people, I made a lot of mistakes, my kids, my wife, everybody around me. But what it does is you go make amends. So you go make it right. If it's a money issue, you figure out how to pay them back. If it's a offend, if I offended you, I ask for your forgiveness. Now you get to pick whether you forgive me or not. Like a lot of people, my ex-wife stayed with it for a long time. She was mad at me for years. And you have to just let that be their issue, but you go to them and you ask for forgiveness. But at least I could walk into a room and if I had offended you and I see you, you know I've addressed it. And so it helps you move on and it gives you self-respect. So um, I then started making a list. I was, I was overweight, I was a big smoker. I was like three packs a day. I did everything, I was, I was addictive, big time. And so I made a list of all the things I wanted to fix. And after I made amends, I started working on myself so that I would like who I was. Um, once I got sober, I got confident that I, if I put my mind to something, I could do it. Because it was something I never thought I could overcome. And so my business started to flourish. Like I, I always knew, like when I was a kid, my friends would be cops and, or cowboys or a cop or a fireman, and I was a real estate guy. I didn't know what it meant, but it was always the only thing I was ever going to do. So like when I was in business, I was broke, but I was never going to waver. Like a lot of guys that I got into the real estate business with, when things got really tough, went to sell copiers or they went into other industries, and I just never would waver. I just stayed with it. And so my early years were really difficult. I was, uh, I was in a house. My house was posted for foreclosure. Uh, one day they came and uh, my banker came and repossessed my car. I had a Mercedes. You'll love this story. I bought it in 1982, like right before the RTC crash. And this car was worth four or five thousand bucks. I owed about twelve thousand on it. And, and the banker came and he said, Bill, I got to come pick up the car because you, you haven't made a payment. And I said, well, uh, and this is after I'd gone through AA. And I said, 
please don't take the car. Uh, I have to pay you. And he goes, Bill, I got to take it. And I said, OK, I'll give you the car, but please give me 90 days to pay you. And he goes, he said, Bill, this car's not worth what you own. I said, just please give me the 90 days. And he took the car, and then I had to go rent a car. And um, so I went and rented a car. I was telling everybody I had car trouble. But uh, about 100 to 110 days after he took that car, I went in and paid him. And I drove that car for another four or five years. But it was a big day for me to honor that commitment and make that, that, that wrong right. So I'm in my house. I'm six months late on my mortgage payment. We would, my son and I lived together, uh, Chris, who's the 50-year-old. I was a bachelor. Uh, we would go out to the street and turn the water on, take a cold shower, go back out and turn it off. Because if I left it on, they'd go lock, they'd lock it. They had turned it off uh, underground, but they didn't lock it. And I, and I realized that if I didn't, if I turned it on, take a shower, go back, turn it off, they never caught me. So I was taking cold showers in a house that was uh, posted for foreclosure for about six months. Um, then I got a break. I, 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 I got a deal doing, I did a tenant rep deal. I was a tenant rep broker at the time. And uh, TGI Fridays, the restaurant, was looking for relocating their corporate headquarters. And I cold called the guy. Because my car was repossessed, I was driving my son's hatchback Volkswagen that had those big bass speakers in the back, you know, the kids love. <laughs> so I would park this car like blocks away and then walk because I didn't want anybody to see the car. But I went and cold called him and he said, well, we're going to hire Roger Staubach. I'm going, well, everybody's hiring him. <clears throat> I said, but he said, I'll tell you what, whatever you show me, I'll honor. So he, I just went and made a list. This is before it got real efficient. I made a list. He honored it. I did the deal, and I think I made $400,000. And that was more money than I'd made in 20 years cumulatively. But what it did for me is it gave me a belief that I could compete with the people I really respected. When I made that deal, I looked and I said, I can do this, and I can compete. And it made me shoot bigger and higher in my life than I ever thought I could. Because we all know in this, in this building that life, bigger deals are easier than smaller ones. Smaller ones take the same amount of time, but bigger deals are greater reward. And I think they're easier, actually, because everybody wants to do them. So, but it, it was a life change in my mind where I, could, I believed that I could compete in business. So life's good, everything's you know, business is starting to come. I'm starting to make some money. I, I now start a development business to where we're building office buildings. And I just took my relationships I had on the brokerage side to start developing. I was a bachelor. I bought a motorcycle. So I uh, got a Harley like everybody did in those days. And uh, we go up to uh, Aspen for 4th of July. And we we're going to go Aspen, Telluride, and back. There was four of us. And um, it's 5th of July. It's a Friday night after the 4th of July. We're leaving uh, Aspen, heading to Telluride. And um, I'm riding a motorcycle, and I'm trying to pass a guy. It's a two-lane road. It's before the pass. The, the, the tunnel was there. And this guy doesn't want me to pass him. And so as I try to pass him, he speeds up. So I, I, I slow down, and as I slow down to get back behind him, he kind of slows down, and he's just looking at me. And so I should have just pulled over, but what I did is I hit, it was two-lane road, so I put the bike in a lower gear and shot around him, and as I got around him, there was a turn and a car coming, and I didn't make the turn. And I flew off the road going like 60, and I'm 30 feet in the air, and this is right after Superman fell off the horse and was, um, uh, Reeves was paralyzed. So I'm in the air, and this is weird, but I was in the air going, I think I need to probably get off this motorcycle. And I push off the motorcycle, and I kind of do one of these, and I just fell. And the impact was unbelievable. I mean, 
unbelievable. I hit and just, it was unbelievable. And I'm laying there and I don't have any pain. And it's just all, everything's warm. And I'm going, you know, that was really bad. I, I, and I'm thinking, I believe in my heart that I'm gonna die laying there. Because I'm going, there's just no way. I'm waiting for the blood like on TV to come out and die. So now, everybody in this room knows you're gonna die, right? But you just don't think it's today. Well, that was my today. And I'm laying in that ditch and I'm making a deal. And I hadn't prayed in 15 years, 20 years. I'm praying. And I don't know if I'd done enough to get to heaven. I didn't know where I was going. And all I kept doing is just praying and going, Lord. So I got my right legs over my throat. This arm, my arms were powdered and I busted my arms. The biggest piece of bone from wrist to elbow was an inch, so it was like a puzzle. So my arms didn't work very well and I'm laying there and I have no pain, it's just everything's warm and I'm waiting to die and I'm praying. And I made a deal, I'm, I'm, I'm estranged from my older, my adult kids because of my alcoholism. They, they hadn't forgiven me, but I hadn't gone back to make my amends. I'm laying there going, if I die today, what's my legacy? And it's not my legacy about business, but what had I done? You know, what have, what is, what have I done? What, are, what is my image to the people that really matter? Have I done anything but be, I was a consumer. I had no intimacy in my life. All I did was take, and it was about stuff. And I'm laying there going, this is not the way I wanna go out. So I'm making a deal and I'm waiting to die and I don't die. And I'm going, I guess I'm not gonna die. And I start looking around and um, I figure out as soon as I realized that I wasn't gonna die and I started thinking forward, the pain hit. And the pain was, it was not fun. And I'm laying there and I crawl up to the side of the road and I just lay on the side of the road. And a couple, in a, they're on a road trip from Louisville, Texas, I'll never forget this. They pull over right away. I, they just saw me laying there and they pulled over. And they get out and him and his wife were in the car and um, they stay with me, they call the police and they wouldn't give me any medication until I got in the ambulance. And um, they, they were so nice. And the funny part of this story is, is that this couple, the guy looks at me, well, because it took like two hours for the ambulance to come. And the pain was unbelievable. I was you know, begging for Tylenol, anything. And the guy goes, you know, uh, about, Five miles back, I was asking my wife if I can get a motorcycle. He says, I don't think I'm gonna get a motorcycle. <laughs> so funny, it's true, I swear to God, that's truth. So they put me in an ambulance, they take me to the hospital. There's no doctors at the hospital, put me back in the ambulance, go to another hospital. I end up in Gunnison, Colorado, and the, uh, the surgeon goes, you know, you really, you're badly, your arms are bad, and he goes, but, I see this every day because of the skiing. So he said, but I was so euphoric that I was alive and then I had a little bit of pain meds in me. I was going, because I thought two hours ago or four hours ago I was dying. I'm going, have at it. Whatever you're going to do, I'm good. So I went in 20 hours of surgery. They pieced my arms back together. I had rods when I woke up. So I wake up in the hospital and I'm sitting up in a bed and my hands are wrapped in gauze and blood is oozing out of the gauze, the white gauze. And I'm sitting with pillows propped up on both sides of me and I've got metal rods from here to here because there's no bone to hold the bone in place to grow back. And I'm sitting there and this guy comes walking in, his name is Paul, I didn't know his name at the time, he's a, per, uh, a male nurse. This guy had been a detective in New York, shot twice, I didn't know any of this, shot twice. Second time he gets shot, he tells the wife, we're out of here. He goes to Colorado, becomes a male nurse. He's my nurse. He walks in, he looks at me, he goes, boy, you're, you're screwed up. You, you did a good job. <laughs> and he's got no empathy, right? None. He's a, he's a, I love this guy. So he comes in and he sticks a bowl of Cheerios on that table that they wheel in front of you. 
This elbow is broken. He puts a rubber stopper in my left hand, which is just like this with rods. Sticks a spoon in it and puts Cheerios in front of me. He says, you got to figure out how to eat, so I'll be back. <laughs> um, and so I start eating the Cheerios, and Cheerios are going everywhere but in my mouth. <laughs> and I started crying. And it's when I kind of realized I had really pretty done a pretty good job on myself. So I'm sitting there going, yikes, this is not good. And, and um, he comes back in and he goes, uh, you might kind of made a mess. I go, yeah. And he goes, well, you know what? I'm going to take you outside. I'm going, you know, I'm propped up on pillows and stuff. And he goes, no, I'm going to take you outside. He said, you need some fresh air. He stuck me in a wheelchair, took me outside, put me under a tree. It's 6th, 7th of July, beautiful weather. I'm sitting there, my arms up in the air. I couldn't move the wheelchair if he wanted me to. And he leaves me there. I've got direct view of where paraplegics come for therapy. So I see guys pulling up in vans and the electric motor picking them up and wheeling them out of their van, getting in the wheelchair to come in for therapy. And I'm, I'm in a wheelchair, but I'm going to walk. I'm fine. So Paulie's teaching me lots of lessons really quickly by just dumping me out underneath this tree. So I'm sitting there. He comes to pick me up, and I go, I got it. I'm in. No more crying, no more complaining. I'm thankful. So I, I go through, uh, I had to keep going through surgeries through that year because when you break your arms really bad, they grow too long and you can't supinate. So they go back in and they break your wrists. So I had to go in, once I'd heal, they go back in and re-break them. And so I'm at home and I'm going through this and I've got this commitment I made with God. I'm going, okay, I, I got to get back, I got to get back right with God. So I go back to the Catholic Church. And in between surgeries and stuff, I would go, I'd go to church. And I, there I am, I'm sitting there again, I'm making lists of what I'm going to do when I get out. I got no, no, uh, no connection. So I bought a house. I was a bachelor. I bought a house before I left on my motorcycle trip. And they moved me in while I was in the hospital. And I had a pool. I didn't have a pool in my other house. And they go, what do you want to do with the pool? I said, have the same guy that was doing it for the guy that owned it before. Just keep him. So I would have nurses at my house, and they would wheel me again out to, in a wheelchair out to the outside to get fresh air. And the pool guy comes, big guy, headphones on. He's a uh, music minister from an evangelical church in Carrollton, Texas, cleaning pools on the side. I mean, this guy was scary when you see him. He was big. And, he comes up and he takes his thing off and he starts talking to me and I kind of tell him what I went through. And second time he comes, he brings a Walkman with a tape. He stuck it on my head and stuck it in my, I couldn't turn it on or off. So I mean, whatever he was, <laughs> and he, play, he plays the tape and then he'd go clean the pool. And then after he cleaned the pool, he'd come back and take it off and we'd talk about Jesus. And God kept putting people in my life, and I just wasn't ready. And I was ready. I just didn't know where to go or how to do it. And so, because um, it was really important to me from laying in that ditch to honor what I said. Because I, when I was scared, I knew I didn't want to be scared again. I wanted to know where I was going. And so, uh, from Paul and other people that were in my life, I accepted Christ in mid-March. So I was in my accident in July on my pool deck. One Saturday morning, I got hit the knees and accepted Christ. And what Paul told me was, he said, Bill, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead, and you ask him to come live in your heart, you will be saved, and you will have a free ticket to heaven. And I'm looking at him going, you mean, I'm in. I'll do it. And so I asked the Lord into my life. My life was changed immediately, on the spot, euphoric. I was like a Fuller Brush guy. I went and bought Bibles. I'm going up to my parents, my brothers, my sisters, sharing 
the word of God. And they were, they were running from me. They're locking doors. They didn't want to see me. I think my parents said yes just so I'd stop. But I had this euphoric feeling because I had peace that I'd never had in my life. I had total peace. So God started convicting me on how I was living. I was dating like most people would date. So after the accident, about 90 days from accepting Christ, I stopped dating. And I committed that I would date. I'd date with a purpose, and I'd honor God in my dating. I'm 47, and I'm telling women that I don't want to have sex before marriage. And they'd look at me like I was a Martian. And I just said, listen, I want to honor God. I want to do it right. I was still had this euphoria about my life. So 90 days from the day I told God, I said, God, okay, if I date a girl, and it, it, I'd never wanted a wife. I just wanted fun. And I said, if I, if I date a girl, and it, I don't think she's wife material, I'll be honest and out and move on. 90 days from that commitment, I met my wife. I'm the most overmarried guy on earth. She's the sweetest, best person I've ever met in my life. She's just unbelievable, God's blessing. If I'd have met her 10 days before, she would have had nothing to do with me. And um, when I was, I was helping her move while we were dating, and you wouldn't believe the, the, the flower vases in her garage from guys sending her flowers. I don't know how I pulled it off. It was God. It had to be. But so I, um, it was just an immediate change in my life. So Keely and I meet, date, and are married in 10 months. And um, I just, you know, it, it, it changed me in business. In business, I used to play in the gray. I always had insecurity. I'd exaggerate. I'm black and white. I tell the truth. And I, I pray before meetings because I want God to guide me. I just, because like I've, like times that like now when the economy's scary, you want to, you know, you need peace, right? And so I just try to lean into God on my daily life. Just ask him for blessings. Please help me be honest. Like I prayed before I came here today. All I want to be is honest and open and hope that, 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 that the message is positive. So Paul tells me I need to start reading the Bible. So I go, well, what, what, you know, what do you, what do you do? He goes, just open it. And I go, well, well, to where? And he goes, you'll open it in the right spot. Just open it. And I just opened it and I started reading it. And I have to tell you, there's been so many times in my life when there's been something on my mind and I've opened it and it's been the right verse. It's been a message that was directed directly at me. And I don't think that's an accident. Now, I went through reading the Bible in a year and did a lot of things after that. But I am a firm believer in opening it and having, you don't have to have a plan, just be committed to opening it. And it'll, it'll give you the message you need that day. Um, I... Um, I just want to do life the right way, and I want to honor God in what I'm doing. Uh, I want to tell you, a story, and I think one of my big parts of my life is sharing my faith. I think my business gives me a platform to talk about God. And I'm really open about my alcoholism because I think God brings you people if you're open. I think so many of us have issues in our lives that we stuff, and if we'd share them, uh, I think openness creates more intimacy. And so I try to be open and share my life journey because you never know who out there needs help. And if they see you and see that you've been able to overcome it, it gives you an opportunity to help them. And so the second part is, is trying to help young people and like young people find jobs and stuff. And if anybody comes for help, they're going to hear about the Lord. And it doesn't mean they have to accept him, but they're going to hear about it from me. And so my purpose today in life is, is talking about God. And so I want to tell you one other story, too. Um, I've got a, so I was like the Fuller Brush Man talking to my brother and my two sisters. And, and they would run when I would come because they didn't want any part of it. My brother comes to, I'm a golfer, not a good one, but a golfer. And he comes to my member guest every year. We're, we're having dinner, getting ready to take him to the airport. This is like... 10 years. I've, I've shared my faith with him 
10 to 12 times, no interest. And Keely and I are eating dinner with him, and I go, uh, isn't it great knowing we're going to heaven? And she goes, it's awesome. And Dan goes, well, how the hell do you know you're going to heaven? I said, I know I'm going. And she goes, yeah, I know I'm going too. So I always carry tracks in my car that a friend John Maisel gave me that's, that talk about asking the Lord into your life. And it's got verses in the Bible, et cetera. So I start talking to Dan about it. I grab the two tracks, put them on the airplane, say, when you land, call me. He calls me, he goes, I'm in. I'm saved. Every Sunday for five years, my brother would leave a voicemail on my phone thanking me for not giving up and thanking me for never stopping asking because of the peace and the quality of life he has today. Now, there is nothing you can do today that's going to be more rewarding than that phone call. And so my brother, I watch his life. His life is, is, is changed. And um, the other thing I would say, it, it's been a big blessing in my life, is a prayer journal. We all pray, but I highly recommend you track your prayers. Like, I started a prayer journal the day I was saved. And um, I keep a list of every prayer. And when I pray, it's not every time, but a lot of times, I go back and start from the beginning and see the ones that have been answered and I've checked off. There's a lot of things I prayed for. I prayed for the wrong thing, and God gave me the right answer. But it gives you a track record that, and a proof, positive, that prayer works. It does work. And like when somebody says they're going to get a sur having surgery and you say you're going to pray for them, pray for them. Even do it the minute you say it. Don't say it and not do it. Do it. Like I always try to write it down because I just have guilt if I, I don't want to miss it. But, but my message to you is that, uh, and I, I really appreciate you having a, you know, um, developer from Dallas come to, uh, to Houston, but uh, I'm... I, I appreciate you having me, but you know my story again is one that was self-destructive. I created my messes, but God just decided that he wanted me on the team, and I'm so thankful he did. And I appreciate you guys giving me the time today. Thanks.